Hey everyone and welcome to another video and today I'm going to be trying something different. Today I'm going to try a bit of a multiple choice type game show interactive thing. I've never really done this before. I'm just going to have a crack. If you like it, let me know. If you don't, then I won't do it again. But today the topic is killing the nexus. So what I've noticed is that especially with platinum two and above clients, people are quite bad at ending the game. Like they can get a lead, they can get ahead, then they might know their matchups, they have decent early game fundamentals, they know their champ's identity. But when push comes to shove, they're in the 15 minutes, or, you know, 15 minutes onwards in the game, and they've got to make a few pivotal decisions, they start to crumble. They struggle to think about the game holistically. And the most important thing is they don't even know how to get better at it. So the, the goal with this video is to give you guys a little bit of a cheat sheet or a, a process in order to get better at the skill of what I call killing the nexus. So before we get into the examples, I want to set the scene with a little bit of an analogy to help you guys understand what the hell we're talking about here. So I view winning a game of League of Legends or in this case, killing the nexus kind of like traveling to a destination in real life. So let's say I was planning my trip from Sydney to New York. I understand that there are many ways I can get there. I could get there via boat. I could do multiple stopovers in different countries. I could do a direct flight. I'm gonna take a different path depending on what my goals are and what my current situation is. Let's say I have a baby. I might not wanna do a direct flight because maybe the flight's too long. I might wanna stop off at multiple countries or maybe I'm with my partner and then, or it's a business trip or whatever the hell the situation is or I got a goddamn cat with me. Whatever the situation is, I'm gonna pick a path that I feel works for me given the circumstance. It's the exact same thing in League. Sure, we're all there to kill the Nexus, but given the tools and the situation you're within, you know, maybe your teammates' tendencies, their mental states, the chant, the, the composition you have, what happened in the early game, everything changes the way you need to go about winning the game. And there isn't, I don't believe that there is this one most optimal path to win the game. It depends on what server you're on, you know, what rank you're at, what your interpretation of your champ's identity is. There are many, many ways to win the game. So this is a skill that we all need to develop in our own unique way. So lastly, before we get into the clips, one thing you need to understand is that yes, theoretically, every move you make in the game is a decision. But when we're talking about killing the Nexus, we only want to highlight the pivotal, pivotal game-changing decisions in the mid game. The ones that leave you feeling, wow, that was big, you know, like a, a massively wrong lane assignment, or you're getting late to a big fight, or it felt like you just weren't doing anything in a particular moment, even though the game pace was increasing. Like these big pivotal moments where you, fit, you, got, you left feeling very confused or you weren't very high impact. They're the ones that we're gonna be looking at today. Let's go ahead and take a look at some examples. So here we are with the first example and welcome to my game show here. I am your host, Coach Curtis. Today, we're gonna to be starting with the Velkos game. We are the Velkos in this situation. We are five and one, very beefy, got two and a half items. You know, our Akali's absolutely popping off on top side. You know, 10 and two Akali, annihilating this Jax. Um, one thing you can see is that we do have triple AP, right? We got Lux support, um, both, you know, we're probably the main carries here and we're all AP. And we're using a Cassadin. Cassadin and a Jax. Jax has started to get that MR. So even though we are ahead definitively, we're not, you know, the game isn't over. The enemy actually have two dragons as well. So let's lay out the facts, guys. Number one, the enemy is beginning to stack MR. The enemy, uh, so our team, sorry, has no TP available. I believe Akali's TP was down. Cassadin is very much scaling. Baron is up. We are 20, nearly 25 minutes in the game. And we just finished Dragon. Okay, in this situation. And it turns into this. This is the kind of the game state we're in. We kind of hover mid after that Dragon. We would have finished up that Dragon there. And as you can see, Akali's kind of went off onto bot side. Um, we've kind of got like a bit of a 4-1 situation here. Jax is off on that top side. So that's where we're at, okay? And remember, before we get into the options here, I'm just gonna, I'm picking random, I'm picking random moments, random what I call pivotal moments out of a bunch of games from some of my clients inside the Midland Academy. These are just random situations at a, at, a, at a wide variety of differing ranks. And it's important that, you know, I'm not gonna get into the rank differentials in this video, but if you're in master tier and we're, you know, we're talking about macro game and pivotal mid game decisions, it's gonna be very different if we're in gold, right? So this one specifically was actually in master tier, but again, I don't wanna to get too specific into that. I just wanna go over more of the overarching process here. So anyway, here are your options. You know, this is where you'd insert the drum roll. Number one, siege mid with Akali, maybe splitting bots, so maybe some form of like 4-1 scenario, leave the jacks to do whatever topside. Group onto the Akali and do maybe some form of like a, 
a siege bot side. I mean, the danger with that one maybe would be that they could just trade off their bot side and maybe just go straight to Baron. Uh, call for Baron Vision top side and control top side jungle. Seems pretty solid. Uh, option four, start Baron instantly. Play for like a finish or a flip. And I'm pulling some of these options out of my ass here, guys. <laughs> some of them are terrible. Some of them, are, you know, are close. Uh, option five, split top. Maybe do a one through one Maybe we go top, get a card to go bot. We do some form of a one through one Maybe a little bit risky given the enemy have a Shaco. You know, some chaos could start, um, but it does actually allow us to utilize the Kha'Zix strong side landing pit, side landing gank threat, sorry. Option six, sorry, let's try split. Maybe call for a hover top side. So we maybe we move on to top side, call our Kha'Zix to hover us top side. Um, again, maybe like a, it turns into like a 2 2 1 or something like that. Um, we could also just shove out and go for a reset, get our item, which is we nearly got our Sonyas, I believe. Um, or you can just do nothing, which is actually what most of the time, most of the clients that I work with in mid game, they don't make a decision. They just go with the flow and whatever happens, happens. Okay. So um, what we're going to do, we'll take a look at what this, this guy, this Velcos does in this situation, and then we'll come back and then we can go over the options. And remember, select an option in your head before we go through this, you know, and as we go through this next clip, select an option, see what you would have done. And then that way we can, you can have a, get more value from this video. As you can see here, we are now, we've just finished up the dragon. Akali's moving her way bot side. We move mid. So it's turning into a little bit of like the, I mean, 4-1, but their Jax is top side. The Nautilus and Shaco are looking for an engagement onto the Ezra and Lux. They don't end up getting it. We end up doing some nice little poke to disengage. Now it looks like here, Akali was spam pinging on my way bot, maybe wanting everyone to, to, to go bot and follow it. I don't really know what the call is here. It looks like everyone's scattered all over the place. Jax is hitting away on that top side. We decide to follow up on this uh, Akali as Velkos, roaming through the jungle, walking through a trillion Shaco, AP Shaco traps. We try to get some damage down to peel the Akali, um, but we're kind of getting railed from the side here. Uh, we get caught off, off guard. We try to flash out. We get assassinated, essentially. Cassidy comes in, picks up a 500 gold shutdown uh, uh, onto you. Akali also dies, giving a shutdown to the Kaiser, And we basically just got aced. So we went from being in a very commanding position to, a, to Jax now basically getting two towers top, basically getting aced. And that actually could even be Baron as well, to be honest with you. Okay, so now that we've seen what actually happened, let's go back to the drawing boards and figure out what the best option might have been. So something to remember, you know, when you're playing the game yourself, you're in this situation, you don't have time to take a step back and be like, okay, everyone pause, everyone, everyone stop, everyone stop moving. Let me think about this and then and then I'll make a decision. You don't have the ability to do that, right? We gotta, we make, we gotta make a split second decision. And so when you're playing, I recommend just having a crack. Whatever feels best for you based on your current kind of, I guess your take on the game, go with it. And then we can review later on. And this is something I'll touch on later, but try not to overcomplicate it. This sort of review where we're really weighing up the alternatives, visualizing what would happen in different situations. This is all in the post game review. This is not something you do in the game itself. This is a post game tool or post game process, if you want to call it that. So going back to the options here. You know, look, I think we could do this, option one, like Siege, maybe like a 4-1 scenario with like Akali trying to get that bot tier two and then we kind of push out mid. I don't mind that because, I mean, we're still relatively close to the Baron, so they can't do the Baron. We have a relatively good Siege with the Ezreal Velkos. So, I mean, it's not terrible. It's, I guess it's somewhat viable, easy to execute. The only problem is that Jax would be banging away there. So it would be, we could just probably trade that off for that. I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, group onto the Akali Siege bot. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of that. I think it's too dangerous. We don't want to... I don't think this is that valuable. Um, you know, I don't want to give access to this tower as well. If we all collapse, then we might give mid tower. I'm not a big fan of that one. I like this one. I really like option three. This would be probably my go-to. I think uh, uh, straight after this, I'd be spamping assistance here. And the reason being is that as Velkos, as my champion, if I'm a Velkos... I want the enemy to come to me. I don't want to walk to the enemy, right? Velcos, when you're playing a lot of these mages, it feels really bad to have to walk you know, cross country, you know, across the map to go to someone else and you're just running through traps or you're getting flanked, you're leaving yourself exposed. I want the enemy to come to me, right? So this is tying back to my champion's identity and our composition. We want people to come to us. We've got the Larks, we've got the Ezreal, come to us. So if we were to control topside, so we just shove our mid and then we move topside, get a little bit of vision, maybe prevent Jax from getting that top tower or even just collect the wave that he shoved out. 
And then ideally, in my opinion, in a perfect world, Akali moves over here and then we try to, you know, try to bait Baron, make a pick with our Lux or your E or whatever, utilizing Fog of War, making the enemy come to us. And, you know, do something like that. I, I don't like the idea of playing bot side here, especially I don't want to move as Velkos. I want the enemy to come to me. Um, and then we might be able to buy time for, for Akala to get that TP up. But once she has TP, she can do whatever she wants. So I like the idea of this. I definitely don't want to start Baron and flip it. I mean, we don't really have a tank, so we can't do that. I hate three, one, one through one in solo queue. I think it's unreliable to theoretical and never ends up working, especially when the enemy has a Nautilus and a Shake or a lot of engage. Doesn't really feel that smart to me. Um, you could theoretically kind of shove out top, call for hover top side, try and break this. But that would only be possible if like a Kali moved over here. So that's questionable. And shove out and reset, yeah, low value. You don't need the gold, don't need the items. Um, and do nothing. I mean, the, the El Clasico, which is kind of what we did here, just go with the flow. Didn't work out too well, did it? So I would say for me, I would go with option three. I think that option one is also relatively viable. Um, I'm sure there are people out there that would do option two. So, you know, for me, I think these two are completely fine. I'd love to hear your comments, guys. You know, see your comments in the section. See what you guys think for each of these examples. That's just my opinion. Um, something to note, this isn't Master Tier. I believe it's EUNE. And not that it really makes too much of a difference. Um... So people are probably more inclined to listen uh, to, to comms. In gold, you probably want to keep it very, very simple. And I'd probably even do number one if I'm in gold. But if it's in master tier, probably number three. So definitely, hopefully, hopefully this gets you guys thinking. As And this is the sort of exercise I do with my own mid games. A lot of the time I go into a mid game pivotal decision and I'll sit there. I might sit there for a few minutes and be like, hmm. What are my options here? What are all the options that I could potentially take? And I start to visualize what would happen if I did that? What would happen if I did that? And this process allows me to develop a much more sophisticated understanding of the game. So here we are at example two. Congratulations, you made it to round two of the game show. Um, we are the Echo in this situation. A bit of a unique one in the sense that we've got Kale that's very far ahead of this rumble. Three levels up, killing it on two items, nearly borderline three items. Uh, Zach. Three level, four levels behind the game. So Kane's pretty out of control here. Uh, bot lane relatively even, maybe slightly favored towards them. We're CSing okay, but we haven't even got two items yet. The enemy have three dragons. So laying out the facts very quickly, we're 23 minutes into the game. Baron is up. Kale is online, up three levels, but does not have TP available. We have TP, which is something to note. Enemy has relatively slow Baron. Kane is up four levels, so we can't really rely on a steal. Um, and the enemy has relatively poor engage, okay? So getting into the options here, option one, we could theoretically coming out of base, we could go bot and tell Kale to go top and group, given we're the ones with TP. That's completely viable. I, like, I don't mind that one. Option two, let Kale split bot, and then if they go to her and they try to collapse onto the Kale, maybe we, you know, we can maybe start Baron in that situation. We could shadow behind the Kale, and if someone collapses onto the Kale, uh, we can take that 2v2 or 3v2, and if they start Baron, I, we can t I can TP the Baron to try and defend anyway. Split topside, maybe do some sort of like a 1-3-1, one, one, like a 1-3-1 one, one, and then classic 1-3-1, one, one, given the enemy doesn't have too much engage. We could 4-1 and group with the team and then get a little bit of control, let Chaos split push bot side. We could also ARAM all together and maybe brute force a Baron, given that we probably win 5v5 at this stage with the Fed Kale. Or you just do nothing, El Clasico. Um, so let's take a look at what this Echo does. Very, a very interesting situation. So here we are coming out of base. It looks like the Kane spawned the Rift on top side. Um, Kale's waddling bot side, looking to potentially split bot side. Echo on the way through decides to do the Krugs. Rumble shows mid. So that means Rumble's not reacting bot. Karma's definitely not gonna be react reacting bot side. So no one's going bot. And the rest of the team goes missing. They're not showing on that bot ward there or anything there. No one's showing topside or mid, essentially. And it looks like Kale realizes that the enemy could just be brute forcing Baron. So Kale starts waddling her way up through bot river, actually getting uh, scuttle on the way through for some reason. Um, and the enemy just start Baron. Now in this situation, remember our jungler is down three levels. He's level 11 to Kane level 14. Um, but for some reason, Kane missed the smite. We're able to come in, create a little bit of space, probably a little bit of an unnecessary ultimate there from the Echo. Now Kale is officially at the fight 
And it looks like, you know, given we got the Baron, the game looks pretty free here because that was their only way of really winning, in my opinion. So if we actually take a look at this, this was a classic example of a situation where we just got lucky, right? We just got lucky that our Zac, three levels down, somehow outsmarted the Kane, and then we bought enough time for KO to get to the fight, and, you know, we're able to somewhat clean up. In an alternate reality, you know, maybe Kale doesn't recognize that they're starting to Baron or Kane hits a smite, they all disengage and then we just have to deal with them getting Baron and then they've stalled out the game and who knows, maybe the game can, can, can be, you know, much closer than it could have been. Something to keep in mind before we go back into the options, it's important that we understand the mindset of the enemy. One of the big things I'm going to talk about in a, in a future video is understanding how the enemy would think. So you may think, well, this is very random. Why would they not react to bot? Or why would they, why would they make this decision? When would you, if you, if you, if you were Kane in this situation, you actually look at this. Well, your comp has very little engage, right? We can't really, they can't really brute force and engage on anyone outside of like a flash stun with Sona. So that's not realistic. Um, but they do have a relatively good team fight, right? They've got AOE ultimates with a the Sona. They've got the Rumble ult. They've got the Karma to peel the Kane. You know, you've got the MF ult. You've got a lot of AOE ultimates. You definitely want to team fight in some capacity. You don't want to deal. No one can deal with this. This guy especially cannot deal with that. He's three levels down. That's not going to happen. So your best bet, honestly, is to try and flip a team fight. If they could get that Baron, they could stall that game out, um, which might buy them time to, to even steal that as well because Kane's going to be still higher level. You know, and maybe the game's very different. So I actually respect the hell out of the call that they made. So let's just not even worry about the KL. Let's just straight flip the Baron, or not even a flip in this case. It's just, just a straight one fight because, again, Kane should never miss, this, miss a smite. So this makes sense. So when we're going over VODs, right, and we're about to weigh up alternatives, and, you know, that's great. We need to look at the game through our lens. But it's important to take a look at how would the enemy be feeling in this in this situation? Why did they make the decision they did? A lot of the time when I'm going through my mid game and I and I and I look at it, I'm like, in the game it didn't make sense, but with you know being objective about it, removing my emotions, maybe looking at the day after, I'll be like, of course they did that. That actually makes a lot of sense. Like if I'm Kane, I'm probably gonna make a similar call. So, you know, you gotta drop your ego, you gotta drop whatever narrative that you have and try to look at things from their perspective. Look at it from their perspective, right? Get out of your own head. You're not the center of the universe, you know? So um, let's go back to the options and see what the best choice might've been. Something to keep in mind, guys, when we're going through these options is that like, when I say, let's let's go, for, let's figure out what the best choice is, that might be the best choice for me in my server. If I were to play this champion, you know, with, with players that I'm somewhat familiar with. Um, it's hard for me to objectively say what is the best. I can give you, like, I can narrow it down and remove things and say, oh, it could be that or that. But a lot of the time, going back to the analogy I said at the start of the video about, like, the, the plane trip, it really depends on what your interpretation is of your champion, how you visualize winning the game. You know, I think that here, you know, I probably would have told Kale to go top and me go bot. Um, that's probably what I would have done because I would want Kale to be with the team. She's really str strong. Um, and I know no one could match me anyway. I could beat Rumble at this stage. I can shove in Karma. I have the TP advantage. So if I, if I made anyone react bot, it would be a win-win. That's probably the easiest to execute. But, you know, in an alternate reality, um, any of these probably still work as we saw here. If we were more on, you know, more aware of what the enemy could do and we spotted them out on the Baron earlier, we could have easily done like a 4-1 or even like this 1-3-1 because the enemy doesn't have much engage and just be more cognizant of them starting Baron. And because their Baron isn't overly that fast, Kale would have had ample time to walk up and we could have screwed with him because you can go in, create space with your W, waste time, buy time for Kale to get there. So note, note how both of them are actually completely viable. This probably would have worked. This could have worked if executed well. This probably could have worked if executed well. Many of these things could have worked if executed well. This one probably maybe not as much because again, you wouldn't have been able to get there to get those wards down. But, um, and, and you know, this one as well was technically that one as well. So a lot of them are relatively similar. But yeah, the, I, I want to get across the point that it's hard to objectively say that the one play is the best. It just depends on, it really depends on the, the mindset of the enemy and what you think they would do and why what they would do at that rank on that server. So again, I want you guys to just be very curious and very open-minded in these situations. But, you know, to be really decisive for me, I would have done number one. But I think a lot of these are actually quite viable. And again, I would love to hear your your take on example number two in the comments below. Welcome to round three. This time we are the fiddle. 
Yes, this is a fiddle six mid, and yes, I do coach a fiddle six mid in the, in the mid lane academy. Uh, as you can see here, we have a 040 Yi, not too hot. Uh, we have a weird situation in top lane where Mordecai's is 0-1, but he's actually up like borderline 60 CS. So even though this KO is 3-0-4, this Mordecai's is definitely not that far behind. Bot side, maybe a little bit, you know, a little bit behind as well. Shivan is getting nice and beefy, and we're relatively even mid lane. And the enemy have two dragons. So in this situation, let's lay out the facts. We see Yi was actually moving bot side on our team, kind of moving bot side, hovering bot, maybe looking for a gank or something. Uh, we decided not to really continue to hover here. Top was behind in kills, but was way up in CS, uh, like I said before, and actually just got a big shutdown onto the Kale, which is amazing. So Kale's actually dead. He got a 300 gold shutdown. Yi is very far behind and useless, as we mentioned, and Ari is actually still missing. We didn't know where she is, and she might be committing bot side here, okay? So it eventually turns into this situation where we go back mid, Yi goes bot, they try to counter gank, uh, the Ari and the Shivana are now hovering on bot side try and looking to maybe collapse or do something for something bot side. Remember, Kale's still dead. So we've got many options here, okay? Option one, we could theoretically try to salvage whatever is happening bot and try to collapse and maybe defend bot lane or whatever. We do have ultimate, but something to keep in mind, we're on 1070 gold. And we're, so we have our mythic gold, we have our Ludens gold here. So we're actually not that strong without our Ludens at this point in time, something to keep in mind. Um, and also the, the problem with option one, it can be a little bit risky. If we move down and they collapse, we might we might get pincered or like, you know, we don't, we don't know exactly what they're doing, especially if they sweep that ward right now. We don't know if they're going to turn onto us or if they're committing or, or, or anything. That's a very risky play. We could shove out mid, try and go for plates. We could shove out mid and actually just straight reset for a mythic and use it as a good reset window. We could actually split the map fully, trade off our bot side and actually make a dive play top side, right? We could actually just move over here and try to kill Kale as she comes back to lane. That's a very spicy one. Um, we could maybe shove out and take enemy raptors, maybe alongside uh, plates, or in this case, not plates, just tower damage. Or we could do the El Clasico, the do nothing special. Okay, so a lot of options here. Um, let's get into the review to see what this guy did. So as you can see here, Ari showed on bot try. Uh, Fiddle decided not to collapse bot, maybe thinking it was too risky or whatever, or maybe didn't want to make a play without Ludens. Checks out the Raptors, decides to hover top side and check out Krugs, I think. <laughs> Krugs are down as well. So he doesn't really shove out mid. Then he waddles back mid lane. Bot lane ends up getting dove. Raptors do come back up, does the Raptors. They push all the way to tier two. Um, he ends up shoving out mid and then tries to stay for mid tower here. Um, looks like he gets mid tower. And uh, he's sitting on 1800 gold here and Dragon's coming up in 30 seconds. And then he decides to make a play onto the Shivana without having spent his gold and then Shivana just escapes. So what we got, you know, really looking at it objectively, I think we got a Raptor camp, we got a tower and we probably denied you know, maybe two waves from the RE, okay? That's kind of what happened here. So let's go back to the options and break this one down. So breaking down the options, guys, you know, uh, look, I really don't like number one. I, I think it's too risky. I mean, I think if you move down and then they go missing, it can easily be a waste of time. And look, yes, I do think being reactive in League at times is appropriate. I just think in this situation, especially since the year zero or three or something, and he's kind of useless, I'd much prefer to to make a proactive play elsewhere. And especially since this Mordekaiser just got a 300 gold shutdown and was up like 60, 70 CS, I'd rather make plays around this Mordekaiser who's likely going to be our win condition. So for me, it's very obvious what the decision is. It's 100% option four. Split the map, screw bot lane, play away from that year. We've got a juicy win con on top side. What, shove out mid, maybe get one more wave, and then park yourself in this position right here. Use the blast cone. Tell this guy to stay. Alt the Kale as she's coming back to lane. She highly likely doesn't have ultimate anyway because um, she just got solid killed by the Mordekaiser. And then you dive her and you kill her. Or you should, you should actually die before she even gets to the tower and you kill her. And in that case, you've got a really, really good win con. Mordekaiser will be really far ahead. And it makes sense. It makes sense with the way this game would pan out. And you can, you and Mordekaiser can take over this game. Yes, it will come at the sacrifice or whatever's happening. But and yes, it kind of sucks that you guys are the both both AP. But um, I think it's a very high impact play. I do think 
you could have also just fully committed to shoving out, getting the tower, taking Raptors, and then insta-resetting for Dragon. Like, I don't mind that. Spending your gold, insta-resetting, preparing for next Dragon. I don't mind that one as well. I think it's completely viable. Um, but you definitely want to get something, whether it's trade the trade the map or do something around here. I don't like the idea of reacting to bot side. I think it's risky. They could easily disengage. Then you get nothing and you miss an opportunity top side. Um, if you felt as though bot lane was your wing con, maybe the Ezreal Yumi were the ones that were ahead, or maybe Yi was ahead, Mordecai was behind. Yes, then I can see the merit behind potentially going bot, hovering bot, and preventing the dive and protecting your bot side. Even at the, maybe even making yourself quite vulnerable. I don't mind it because it would be appropriate. It would make sense in reference to the wing condition. Um... But in this case, yeah, it doesn't make sense. So notice how I'm always thinking about the wing condition as well. And a lot of these examples, it really depends on what the wing condition is. And the wing condition, your interpretation of the wing condition is going to be different to a lot of other people. You know, it's so interesting. The last thing I will say here is that, you know, I've had many reviews with clients. I mean, I do high ELA reviews, low ELA reviews, but especially in my high ELA reviews, sometimes with another GM client, we'll spend, you know, 10 minutes having a discussion about what we perceive to be the correct way to win the game or who do you want to play for split, make yourself the win condition, or do you want to put those resources in someone else? It's There's no kind of overarching God kind of, you know, shining down and being like, you guys are both wrong, it's this. No, I mean, we're trying to figure it out. We're both trying to have a crack. And I'm never holding on to my opinion. If I if this, if this I do this next time and it doesn't work, then it is what it is. It's just, you got to slowly, incrementally develop a more sophisticated understanding of the game by going through this process, visualizing alternatives. So this last one, we're in example four, we are the victor. So as you can see, there's a few things. Our Alawi is fed as fuck. Uh, their vein is quite beefy. Ezra was actually on two items. I've got Morimana, which is good. Um, uh, Kane is a little bit annoying. Blue Kane with those two items can be quite annoying. But look, I would say our team is definitively ahead, kind of minus this one and eight Lux. So we know Alawi is a Demon Lord. We know Baron is up. We're at 20 minutes now, 44 seconds. No one has TP available, and we know that the Kane is quite scary, but we do have a stoppy here. We have a stopwatch. Okay, this is kind of setting the scene. And eventually turns into this. So if we go back, we just finish this dragon here, um, and it turns into this situation. So we kind of go over to the, the blue, allow he kind of starts moving up top side, and we're in this situation here. So these are the options. We could maybe grab blue, reset, um, and then you know leaving that bot lane wave and maybe walk back bot after. We could catch bot directly after the dragon, shove it out. We could instantly reset. Maybe or get maybe get the blue then instantly reset or just insta reset in general. We could grab the blue and stay on the map. Maybe because we have a decent amount of we don't have that much gold, we could theoretically stay on the map. We could grab the blue, reset after dragon, tell Lowie to go bot. Or we could do nothing. Okay? These are our options here, in my opinion. Might be some more options, but I'll say these are the main ones at least. Okay. So let's take a look at what um, Daniel here does. So this is them cleaning up that, that, that little skirmish there. They end up securing the dragon. Um, and so what he does straight after the dragon, he ends up seeing bot wave and going straight bot. So he goes straight bot here after that play. Um, and he stays again for another wave. So sk skimming this forward a little bit. Then he goes to the blue. So then he went, so he went bot, got those, you know, one and a half waves, two waves, and then grabs the blue. He's got no C pots left and then resets. Okay. Let's take a look at what happens as a result of that. As a result, now no one is bot side. Allow is now top side. Team gets caught out a little bit. He's forced to catch mid. And the game's turning into a little bit of a fiesta. It looks like Vayne was matching the Alawi top. No one is bot side. No one has TP. We're forced to try and collapse onto the Alawi, but Vayne is trying to shred down this Alawi. Luckily, this, this Alawi is a Demon Lord and survives the 1v3, but this could have easily been a flip. Okay, so now we have a bit of context. Let's actually go back and take a look at what I believe the most optimal choice was. So to quickly recap what Daniel did, after this dragon, he went bot, got this wave and the next wave. Then he went to blue, got the blue, then reset. Now, in my opinion, the main problem with this decision is that he then forces his Alawi to go to the top side of the map rather than bot side. 
because, and, and I don't like that because Alawi is your main win card. I believe that Alawi was like 8 and 0 or something. Just really, really strong. She's, she's like a demon lord. Really, really strong. And the one person on the enemy team that can match uh, Alawi at this stage is the Vayne. I believe Vayne was like 7 and 3. She has two items, like Shield Bow, Rage Blade. She's the only champion on the enemy team that can re reliably deal with the Alawi. Even though Alawi doesn't have TP, it doesn't even matter because. Um, She's the one that's going to be like dragging multiple members bot side, which is going to relieve pressure for you top and potentially give you guys a Baron angle. If we go bot, what that does is sends a signal to the Alawi that we want bot farm that she should go top because she's just going to go to the nearest wave that's that's you know nearest wave to her, and then that's you know you're not then Vane was able to match Alawi top side. And the reason that's good for the enemy is that Vayne's not being forced to the other side of the map, such that even if we were to go on top side to help the Alawi, you know, that he's not dragging pressure anywhere, right? He's dragging pressure next to the Baron. So this is convenient for Vayne anyway. Vayne doesn't need to go to the wrong side of the map to deal with the Alawi. So in my opinion, if he, if he actually either, I think, I think he probably should have left this or, okay, he could do this. I think this one, option five, grab blue. Insta reset, replenish resources, get straight back in the map, maybe come by mid, hover topside, whatever, and tell Alawi to go bot. Tell Alawi to split push bot side. If Vayne were to go try and match Alawi, right, in that situation, then you guys get full control of topside because Vayne's like basically the only strong member top and you guys might even be able to, you know, just get something done, take their camps, whatever you need to do, get top tower, whatever. Um... Uh, alternatively, if Vang shows top or, or mid or whatever, which is likely the case, then Alawi is just going to get free pressure on this tower, inevitably break that because no one can match that Alawi. And then he, she's going to be exerting maximum amount of pressure and it seems really good. I mean, grabbing blue and, and resetting after dragon and walking back bot, definitely not an option. Catching bot after dragon um, and shoving it out. I mean, I don't like that for obvious reasons, like I said. Instantly resetting feels like a waste because you want to grab the blue near you. Grab blue and stay on the map. I think that's also okay if you really want to do that because you don't really need to reset, especially since you shouldn't be using any C pots for this, the blue buff anyway. And just tell Alawi to go bot straight away. Um, so these are all, you know, in my opinion, suboptimal. And this may seem like an obvious choice, right? A lot of people will say, oh, of course... You know, I'm not going to go bot side and tell Alawi to go bot. But in the heat of the moment, again, I see this time and time and time and time again, especially when you're ahead like this. I mean, the game feels good because you've got a 7 0 Alawi or whatever. People get complacent and they don't know what to do. They know, maybe they don't know what to do with the beauty of, you know, the God's eye view, looking at the map and being able to sit here and analyze everything. But in the game, they don't make any decision. A lot of the time, they'll go with do nothing or they'll just default autopilot to the, the easiest thing or the most convenient thing near them, which in this case was for Daniel, which was bot lane farm. Okay, so let's go a little bit deeper, guys. So at this stage, you might be wondering, Curtis, what the hell was the point of that entire exercise? Going over four random examples of situations I'm never really going to be in myself. Uh, maybe I don't even play those champions, whatever. What's the point? Well, I wanted to show you what the process actually looks like. I mean, obviously, we're not going to sit there and draw out all in pretty colors what the options are, but that's the sit that's the process we've got to go through if you want to get better at this skill with these pivotal mid-game decisions. So what does the process look like? Number one, we play the game with as much intention as possible and be willing to fail. Number two, see the result of what you did. What is the result of the choice you made? If you wanted to really, you know, go top in a specific situation and split the map or whatever, what bang for your buck did you get? What value out of your decision did you get? Then in the review, we need to visualize alternatives. What are the other alternative decisions that we could have made in this situation? Understanding is that the, understanding that there were consequences for our actions. In League, there's no such thing as like, I make this decision and there's zero trade-off. There is always, always, always a consequence for your actions or a trade-off or an alternative because it's time and time and resources. It's, it, it, you're always trading something off. And then the last step is that we reflect, we understand it, we make sense. Okay, that makes sense. And we move and we execute again. And we do this again and again and again and again until we start to develop a very sophisticated understanding of the game. And do you need coaching to follow this process? No, it just speeds it up. And what I found is that most people fail at this process for the following reasons. 
Number one, they're lazy and they just don't want to get into the details or they want someone else in the game to take control. Number two, their ego is in the way. They want to shift blame to the enemies or their, their teammates, whatever. They fail to take total responsibility for the outcome of the game. Number three, they find the process overwhelming. You know, they just want the quick fix, the quick answer. You know, they 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 can't find a quick answer as well, so they don't even bother. So they just don't even do the reviews, right? It's like, well, they know there's no quick answer and they don't want to be bothered to go, you know, they find the whole process overwhelming, so they just do nothing and they just pray to the gods that they're randomly going to get better at the game. Number four, they can't accept that the choice they made was wrong because they're too attached to some narrative. You know, maybe... Um, you know, there was a game where that Kale, you know, the one that the Kale got really strong. Maybe Kale was behind in the early game, or he has he hates Kale as a champion. And in order to really recognize Kale as a win condition, he would have to recognize that Kale has some strengths and that Kale had to was maybe the main carrier of that game. You know, a lot of the time people have these weird invisible narratives about champs or mental blocks, and they fail to see these options, or they fail to accept that the choice they made was wrong because of these underlying mental blocks or whatever they have or weird narratives with these champions. And a lot of the time, it's really hard for them to accept reality. It is very, very difficult, depending on how you know how deep that narrative goes. And the last one, they just simply don't want to see the consequences of their actions. Therefore, they're not incentivized to change. You know, if any one of us are in one of those games, right? Let's say we are go back to the first one with the Velkos, and we randomly walk bot over those, two, those Shaco traps. We give 1,100 gold worth of uh, shutdowns or bounties, and we still manage to win that game. Do you think many people are going to go back to that moment and be like, hmm, I should have maybe not done that. We maybe, we nearly lost the game off that. Like most people are going to skim over it and be like, oh yeah, yeah, yippee, I won the game anyway. It doesn't really matter. You got to, I mean, this is where it's easier said than done. You know, I'm sitting here, I mean, in, in, for most of you, you know, it's really easy to sit here in, in hindsight and say, yes, I will review that, that situation. But you know, when you're in the heat of it and you're trying to do a three block, whatever it is, it's hard. And I understand that, but I'm just really sending it out there. These are the reasons that I've, 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 I've come across um, with my clients at the Midland Academy. Now remember, even if you have no bloody clue on what the most optimal choice is, or even what the second best choice or the third best choice is, it's okay. The process of just trying to think about and visualize what the alternatives are, and just trying to come to the conclusion or trying to find the answer, is that is how you get better at the game. Like even for myself, like I never, I, I'm still learning. I'm permanently a student of the game. You know, I might look back at this video in two months from now and think about Curtis, you're wrong on all of them. I would have had a different situation. I would have had a different hypothesis. You're always improving at the game. And I don't ever do these things in my own reviews and be like, this is the answer. Like, this is it. This is the best choice ever. It's like, well, it could be. It might be, and, and that actually makes sense. And a lot of the time when I'm going through this process, I'm just learning maybe a thing or two. Oh, interesting, that's how that champion works. Or interesting, I never thought of that. Oh, I can understand the mindset of that champ now, why they would make that choice. I'm just over time developing a very sophisticated understanding of the mid game. And the last point I want to make, guys, is that over time, the process does become easier. You know, because in a way, you're forever able to kind of cross out options because you know that it's just not realistic. You're never going to do that choice. I have like rules where I try to avoid one through one at all costs. So one through one just isn't even an option in my mind. You know, so that, and so over time, you know, due to our experiences, we'll get better and this process will be streamlined. And remember, the more champion mastery you have, the easier this will be and the easier it will be to come to decisions. And if you plan to do this sort of review, guys, only do it for the core two or three pivotal moments in the game. You're not going to have time to sit here for hours and hours on end going over every single decision. Like, here we go. Let's play multi-choice here, multi-choice. Let's get Curtis into another multi-choice here. No, we're going to do it for maybe two or three uh, pivotal moments in the game. And that is it. Okay. Have a crack. Have some fun. Hopefully it gives you think, you know, gets you to think in a particular way. Otherwise, cheers.